Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of The Coal Scene. I'm Chris Hamilton with the West Virginia Coal Association, and I'm joined in the studio here today uh, with, with Governor Tomlin, our, our state's uh, 35th governor. Governor, uh, thanks for taking the time uh, to come by today uh, to bring us up to date on some issues and your administration. Uh, I was reflecting right before the show, and I believe this is your third visit here with us. Uh, first as uh, Senate President Tomlin, then as Acting Governor Tomlin, and fast forward, and here you are as our state's 35th uh, governor. Uh, congratulations. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chris. It's good to be back on the show again and uh, to talk about the issues, especially those involving uh, production of coal in West Virginia. Uh, you know, I know when uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also been about three weeks almost to the day when, when you delivered uh, your, your State of the State address. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's been three weeks already, right. but uh, I recall when a lot of comments, it was very, very uplifting, a very powerful speech, and uh, certainly provided, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, good initiatives for our state legislature. Uh, could, could you take a, just a few moments and maybe reflect on some of the highlights uh, and some of the main initiatives within your state of the state? Absolutely, uh, Chris. Uh, one of the things that I've been very proud of over the past uh, 12 to 14 months has, has been the amount of uh, new jobs and new investments in the state of West Virginia. Uh, last year we had our biggest uh, year of investment ever with over uh, three billion dollars new investments with thousands of new jobs being created in our state and uh, we once again uh, were one of the few states that ended up with a budget surplus in last fiscal year. Our budgets, uh, our revenues are running ahead of estimates uh, for the first six months of, uh, of this year. We continue to pay down our uh, long-term liabilities out there, our workers' compensation uh, uh, fund is, is being paid off earlier than expected. Uh, those uh, premium rates have, have dropped uh, nearly 50 percent in the last five years and, and those are positive things that we have uh, uh, going on in the state of West Virginia. Our unemployment rate is below the national average. Uh, we, our unemployment compensation fund is, is uh, solvent and is getting better each month. So we dwelled a lot on, on the, the good things that are happening in West Virginia. And I think it's important that we as West Virginians, you know, tout the position that we're in right now. Uh, obviously, there are things that need to be done. Uh, we need to address our last li big liability, that being our other post-employment benefits, or OPEB as it's called, which have been about a $10 billion deficit uh, or a, a liability. And, uh, and we, I really believe that uh, by the end of the session that we'll have uh, passed a, uh, an OPEB uh, 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 payment plan and, and uh, that will be uh, our last uh, unfunded liability that we have in this state out there, the one that we have not addressed. So, you know, those, that's a kind of the, the positive things that we are doing. As far as uh, this legislative session, uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, various areas. Uh, we're dealing with minor safety. Uh, a lot of it in response to the reports uh, after the UVB disaster. Uh, we're dealing with uh, improving education in West Virginia. Uh, we're dealing with substance abuse, a huge problem that uh, it goes from one end uh, of our state to the, to the other. So, you know, there's a lot of things out there that we're dealing with this session, and we're having great cooperation with the legislature as far as moving our legislative program through. Well, we certainly appreciate all your, your efforts to help uh, promote and facilitate uh, you know, greater greater coal promotion or production in the state. Uh, and and we, we find ourselves in a real strong market at the current time, particularly on the export uh, market. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of opportunities there. And Marcellus Gas, I know, is, is coming on. Mm -hmm. uh, and and could, could you talk just a little bit about Marcellus Gas? I know there's a lot of interest even within our in industry. Right. Uh, and I know you've devoted a lot of time, as has your administration, mm -hmm. trying to uh, secure one of those cracker plants. Sure. Here, uh, so could you talk about a cracker plant, what it means, and oh, absolutely. Marcellus Shell is relatively new to the state of West Virginia because now we have the technology to do the horizontal drilling at several thousand feet below the surface out there. Uh, let me just go back a little bit and say that we have tried for the last uh, three or four years to come together and get all the stakeholders together to agree on a bill on regulating the Marcellus Shell. And we were very fortunate back in December when I called the legislature into a special session 
uh, we were able to uh, uh, do the regulations on the drilling uh, portion of, of Marcellus Shell. Uh, we, we have provisions in there to protect our environment. We have provisions in there uh, specifying the rights of, of the surface owners. Uh, we were able to set the, uh, the, the drilling permit fees out there so that we would able, be able to have the revenues uh, to, uh, to have the additional inspectors uh, uh, out there in the field making sure the drillers were doing things properly and also making sure that we had the people working in the permitting section so we could get the permits done in a timely manner. So that was a bill, had great discussion, we had inputs from all sides and only had five dissenting votes in the entire legislature. So I think that was very important that we get on the books, you know, what the rules are for Marcellus Shell drilling in West Virginia. Uh, obviously the, the biggest uh, impact probably will be not only the, the natural gas produced, but the, uh, the crackers and uh, that is basically take, taking the waste product from the Marcellus Shell, mostly being ethane, it will put it through a cracker plant and turn it into ethylene, which is, is uh, one of the basic building blocks for our chemical industry. The, uh, to get one of these cracker plants, it's about a two to three billion dollar, say B with a billion dollar investment out there. And, and for each one of those that we get, it's anticipated that the downstream uh, uh, plants that will spring up because of that will create in the neighborhood of about 12,000 jobs in West Virginia. So, you know, it, I think we have the opportunity now you know, with Marcella Shell to, to really you know, be able to, 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 to catapult to West Virginia forward, to be able to create the kind of jobs, good paying jobs with benefits that, that we've always wanted in West Virginia. So it's an exciting time. I feel that uh, we're in the running for one, at least, or, or at least one, maybe two crackers in the state of West Virginia. And we've been wor uh, working with these investors for the last year uh, to do everything we can to, to make sure that we do at least land one in our state. I know there has already been some real quick legislation that you you advanced uh, that's that's passed uh, during this session right. of the legislature, which will aid and assist in those efforts to bring one of those plants here. Absolutely, uh, we we have a little bit of a disadvantage with uh, some of our property tax issues uh, compared to Pennsylvania or Ohio. So what we've suggested and the legislature has agreed to is to any uh, uh, ethane cracker that they spend more than $2 billion on in West Virginia, uh, their tax rate for 25 years will be a salvage value. So, you know, that really kind of puts us on a level playing field, which makes us more attractive to be able to attract one of the uh, crackers into the state of West Virginia. We, we are obviously very supportive of uh, other industries mm -hmm. in the state, particularly natural resource industries right. like the oil and gas industry, and we wish them well, and we, we have a lot of issues that mm -hmm. we, we work on together. Uh, we, we often, uh, after we leave a meeting with those guys, we'll say, geez, we have our own cracker plant opportunities right. within right. coal if we could ever get EPA sure. you know, to loosen up uh, its restrictions on our new mining operations. Right. Uh, you know, We look around the state and we see the you know, the kind of investment that companies, the mining companies are prepared to make, many have made, you know, to open up new uh, new facilities, new production right. units, hire new people, and I know you're well aware of that, and you've really been crusading on behalf of, uh, you know, the coal industry uh, over the past uh, year and a half, or actually much longer, it's probably uh, uh, throughout the past decade right. or, <laughs> or longer, but uh, we, we appreciate that and, and hope that we can you know, eventually, you know, break through that uh, backlog of permits. Well, absolutely. The, you know, the coal industry has been the backbone of our economy in West Virginia for nearly a hundred years now, and I think that coal still has a, a, a good future in West Virginia. Obviously, we're uh, we disagree with the federal EPA, and uh, that's the reason we have the uh, the lawsuit in federal court in Washington D.C. now, and we'll continue to pursue that. Uh, I, I certainly feel that the EPA in, in, in West Virginia's uh, coal cases has overstepped their bounds, and the, the federal court recently ruled that uh, in certain areas they had overstepped their bounds, and and you know kind of smacked their hands a little bit. But we're we're pursuing this lawsuit. Uh, uh, as we all know, uh, worldwide uh, coal, especially metallurgical coal, is is in high demand, and that's been one of the things for the, for the past nine or ten years that has enabled West Virginia to have those uh, revenue surpluses uh, that we've been able to enjoy in West Virginia. So I think that you know, we will continue, you know, to fight the EPA. I mean, we want the uh, coal mined environmentally proper, but at the same time, we're talking about jobs and good-paying jobs in the state of West Virginia. And that's what you know. I think that we all need to be working toward 
you know, to make sure that we're able to responsibly mine coal in West Virginia and be able to provide the kind of jobs where people can uh, raise and, and feed their families in our state. You know, I think I think back the issue, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago or so was post mine land development. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the state was accused of of uh, not uh, leaving uh, post mining areas uh, conducive for for additional growth and right. development of a commercial or recreational uh, type. And here again, fast forward, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I believe you were responsible for championing some legislation that that caused uh, our Commerce Department to work closely with land companies, mining companies. Right. And I was just looking at some information uh, a week or so ago, and we, we now have a whole new industry uh, that has uh, developed here on post mine lands, everything from Cambellus up in the northern part of the state mm -hmm. to a brand new high school that opened in Mingo, in Mingo right. County and a, a lot of development in between. Right. Well, yeah, and, and that is especially in southern West Virginia where the, the terrain is very mountainous down there that has kind of uh, prohibited, us, prohibited us or stifled us uh, as far as being able to attract mine or manufacturing jobs and, and uh, you know the, uh, the availability of flat land is something you got to have if you're going to build any large facility on and as you've said you know a new uh, Mingo Central High School we got airports we got a, a new conference center at Chief Logan mm -hmm. State Park a regional jail uh, uh, for in the Southwest Regional Jail I mean, all these uh, large facilities are built on, on uh, post-mining uh, land sites. And, and I think that uh, they, we have a lot of potential down there to be able to uh, you know, continue to use those, uh, those uh, sites once they've been mined. And, 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 and you know, another thing I'd like to see is, is some of our housing facilities. Uh, you know, we've got so many people that live in the flood zone. You know, to be able to get those people up out of those zones, and, and it would probably in the long run save the state and federal government money simply with the fact that every time that uh, we have a flood, FEMA has to come in with millions of dollars, the state has to put in millions of dollars just to get these people either relocated or back into their homes. And I think that we do have a lot of potential on the, uh, the post mining land sites down there to, to do some, uh, uh, not only creating jobs, but for recreation as well as housing. All that has to uh, <coughs> rely upon more planning and more cooperation right. on, the, on the front end. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing a lot more of that out there today than what we did three or four years ago, 10, ten years ago. Yeah, I, I, and I think part of that is because of the 1970s mentality on, mm -hmm. on the uh, putting the, the land back to the approximate original contour. I think the, the fact that uh, you know, the industry and, and the, our development offices have been able to show that this man can, uh, this land can be used for a, a higher and better use. You know, to leave it flat if, if there's going to be uh, uh, it's going to be used for uh, something productive out there. And I think that mindset of the '70s is slowly mm -hmm. changing, but we are, I think, moving in, in the right direction. We used to say, you know, you, we, and you think back, but they used to we used to put all these roads in and infrastructure mm -hmm. and buildings during the active phase of mining. And then the federal government and our environmental laws uh, would require that we remove all the roads, remove all the power, and uh, you know that's one of the that's one of the highest cost factors mm -hmm. of any site development uh, is moving dirt and site prep uh, right. for any to accommodate any kind of an industrial or commercial facility. Yeah, I mean, it never did make sense to me mm -hmm. because the mining operations, as you've said, have built the roads super heavy duty roads mm -hmm. because they uh, haul coal on them. So the, probably the state couldn't afford to go in and build that type of a road. Why should those be taken out? Why should the three-phase power, the high, right. uh, power lines, be taken out? Many, almost water, all cases, there's, there's in water cases. And, and sewer there. So, yeah, my thoughts are after millions of dollars of investment, you know, why take it out? And if the land is ever used, you got to pay to put it back in. So, you know, let's be able to keep it where it is and and, and, and make a good use of money that's already been invested. The industry, the coal industry, much like the uh, the new expanding uh, oil, oil and gas, natural mm -hmm. gas business in the state, uh, manpower development, workers are, are still still a problem uh, in in a number of number of areas. You know, I we know mining companies that that have equipment, spreads of equipment, and just can't find right. you know qualified uh, people right. that's ready to assume those positions. And uh, I, I know it's a statewide problem. Do you have any, any thoughts on, 
you know, how we go about preparing and recruiting our next generation of workers. I've, uh, in your association, Chris, has said that uh, there's over a thousand mining jobs that could be filled today if we had the qualified mm -hmm. miners to do it. And of course, we lost a, a generation of miners, you know, because people thought the mining industry was going down. But you know, now that it is back, we, we do need those miners. And, and you know, I know that you're recruiting both in-state and out-of-state mm -hmm. to do that. But one of the problems we have is substance abuse. And you know, you got to have people that's going to be, you know, not going uh, to, uh, to, to work uh, under the influence of, of some sort of a substance. It's just too uh, risky, too, too much of a dangerous uh, job out there. You know, to be impaired going to work, and and one of the things that uh, I hope to do this uh, in, in the coming months is, especially for our people that are getting workforce development uh, training money, is to require uh, pre-training screening. And if you cannot pass a drug test before you you know you'll be qualified for a, for a program, you're going to have to go get yourself uh, straight and then come back because what's happening? We're tr we're spending millions of dollars in state. We're training people, but yet they can't pass the drug test once they're finished. Yeah, you know, I think that you know the, the, that they should be, you know, uh, screened up front to make sure that they're clean. And then let's put them through there. Then we can put them directly to work. And I, I think it not only applies to the mining industry, but all industry across the state. We, we have always had a number of companies that have uh, reached out and, and tried different partnerships mm -hmm. with uh, high schools and community colleges, and right. and uh, we're we're presently uh, having a lot of discussions like that. Again, there's mm -hmm. a lot of interest of. Uh, uh, within our association and our member companies uh, partnering with uh, actually with local high schools mm -hmm. now so so mining can be introduced at a at an earlier uh, grade right. uh, you know with younger students mm -hmm. so so it can provide uh, you know the op the, the realistic opportunity for a job uh, you know within that industrial sector right. upon graduation and and we're having a lot of success with that. And it, and it also, you know, I can't help but to think that it provides a hope and optimism mm -hmm. for some of those kids as they're, as they're going through those uh, teenage years as well. Sure. And, and that could have some, you know, some other positive uh, consequences. Well, I think so too. And I think one of the things we've been able to do, and I'm very proud of, of being a part of that, is being able to, to create our community and technical college system in West Virginia. We now have all of our community colleges that are freestanding with their own mm -hmm. board of directors, you know, their own mission and goals out there, which are, you know, going out. Uh, my my uh, guidance to them is, you know, you don't wait for customers to come through the door. You got to go out and see what businesses need, and 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 develop the kind of programs to to, to give our people the kind of skills they need for the jobs that we have today and we'll have tomorrow. I think it's an excellent idea that you as an industry are, are going out and, and getting into the high schools and, and uh, the middle schools because everyone is not cut out to go to college. Uh, you know, and for those people who would like to get into to being a coal miner or working on, in the oil and gas industry, you know, a lot of those people need to make that decision you know, early in high school where they can get that kind of additional training and skills that they need. When they come out of high school, they can basically, you know, take whatever uh, uh, test they need to, and then go right to work because those are good-paying jobs in our state that does not require a, uh, a college education. Now, you can't diminish the fact that we need college graduates in this state. I mean, that's another part because we do need the, the people with both the two and the four-year degrees out there because mm -hmm. there are jobs, and especially, you know, now with the the Marcella Shell coming on, you can read in the paper there. People needing engineers and accountants and, and a whole variety of things, and of course we need good educators also. So, you know, there, I think the, in West Virginia that you have a choice. You can, you know, get the kind of training you need, uh, either a technical school, a, a community college, or a, a four-year program. And, and I think there's jobs that are there waiting if you want to get out and pursue one. Well, we we appreciate everything you're doing and what your administration is doing. We're working very closely in these areas and. And uh, you know, I think we're think we're all on the right track. Okay. Well, we're just about out of time, and uh, we're going to switch gears here and go to a different uh, segment of our program. So okay. thanks so much for for dropping dropping in on us, and uh, we appreciate all you're doing, and especially your your friendship. So okay. thanks so much. All right, Chris, enjoy Governor. it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break and then we'll return and we'll have uh, Tax Commissioner Mark Mucow with us here uh, to talk about some of the, uh, some of the tax revenues uh, from our energy, uh, energy industries. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. 
These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our coworkers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. This problem is closer than you think. So is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome back to the coal scene. Joining me in the studio is Mark Muco, who is the deputy director of our Department of, of Revenue. Mark, thanks again for, for coming by. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about the uh, the economy and the state of West Virginia and our and our and our tax base? Uh, how does uh, the projections for 2011 compare to 2010? Well, 2010 was a record year for the state. We had uh, GDP growth of about 4%. Uh, the mining sector, along with the real estate and professional services, were key to growth, over 43% attributable to those three sectors. Uh, 2011, a little bit slower for growth, but still probably a little better than the national rate. The national rate kind of dropped from around 3% in 10 to probably about 1.7% last year. So a little bit slower growth. Uh, in the next couple of years, we'll probably see growth in the 2% neighborhood. Uh, not quite as good as I mean, initial year coming out of the uh, Great Recession, but still doing fairly well. Okay. And what does the, what does the overall contributions uh, from coal represent today in terms of tax dollars to the state, particularly severance? Coal has been the, uh, the big story on uh, tax collection increases over the last seven years. Uh, back in 2004, we collected about $184 million. Uh, this year, we're probably going to collect $500 million, uh, wow. big increase. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, the legislature has enacted uh, since 2006 about $400 million, $400 million in tax cuts. We've already digested about $200 million, got $200 million to go. But coal severance revenues during that period of time went up about $266 million. So the, the coal uh, severance tax is more compensated for the tax reductions. So tax reduction, for instance, on the food tax, would that, uh, like would that food, be Like uh, on the food tax, we've, uh, our, uh, but that's a $160 million tax cut. Mm -hmm. 80 million has come and gone. We still got 80 million to go is on the phase out. Also, the corporate tax rates uh, have been phased down. Uh, we've provided low income relief to, on the personal income side and a number of other little minor adjustments. So we could almost credit in some ways, uh, at least people in my position representing my organization, the, uh, the, the credit for low income and the food, and the food tax uh, offset uh, perhaps being a factor of the increase uh, revenues uh, you know, pulled from some of the energy industries such as coal. Most definitely. The last time we phased out the sales tax on groceries was during the late 70s when we, when we had a coal boom. Mm -hmm. We have a coal boom right now and uh, with, with that as a phase out of the sales tax on groceries again. You know, the coal boom right now has just a little bit of an artificial floor, and, and by that I mean uh, we've, we've used the phrase uh, crisis in waiting because we've actually seen, uh, have seen or experienced a decrease in coal production over the past mm -hmm. couple of years, mm -hmm. but that pricing level remains very strong, almost at unprecedented levels, and so you know, since ta the tax is based on the sale price of coal, there's there's a little bit of a of an offset there. Right. The the, the boom has mostly been price related. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, production of coal went from over 150 million tons uh, five years ago to a little less than 140 million tons. We're projecting that to continue to slide over the next three four years, down to about 126 million tons per uh, per year. But the price, particularly on the export markets. Uh, in 2003, it was around $40 a ton for metallurgical coal. Uh, latest, latest data I have is over $181 million a ton, $181 a ton for coal. So that's a big jump, uh, and that certainly helped us on the on the severance tax receipts. That, that seems, uh, you know, that seems in the in the in, certainly in the neighborhood. Uh, yeah, that's a real uh, testament to our uh, uh, desired coal reserves in the southern part of the state, in mm. particular. Uh, mm -hmm. And to the uh, the men and women that make up the the coal industry that mm -hmm. you know are involved in the extraction of that mineral, it's truly a you know a quality of coal, coal that is desired uh, worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly uh, uh, you know assists uh, tremendously in the offset of uh, in the balance of trade, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, not only from West Virginia but the nation and our and a lot of the foreign countries that we export coal to. Mm -hmm. 
Our exports are up about 40 percent compared to last year, and uh, metallurgical coal is the biggest factor. Although steam coal has actually also uh, increased in, in mm -hmm. exports recently. Uh, I think uh, I think we export coal to 20 some foreign destinations mm -hmm. at the current time. We got uh, coal going to Europe. Yeah, Europe's a, a, a big market, probably over 40 percent. But uh, Brazil, uh, coal to Southeast Asia, uh, even some coal going to Egypt. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. It's a it's a, a worldwide market. Uh, if you know, if we could, uh, uh, if we could get to our U.S. EPA and, and get some new mining permits to facilitate a lot of proposed or planned expansion and development of new reserves and new operations here in the state, uh, you know, going forward, maybe maybe we could uh, slow that uh, those that decreased uh, production trend that you you noted earlier. Right, the, the regulatory environment is one of the factors that's playing into the projections for a decrease in production. I don't think there's any question about that, and we're you know we're sitting here uh, and we have a strong export in the state's uh, proximity to uh, the export market to the seaboard, if you will. Uh, uh, allows West Virginia to be uh, the leading uh, uh, coal export state in, in the mm. country. I think mm. uh, you know we account for uh, close to 50 percent of the of the nation's total export uh, mm. uh, tonnage. Mm. Uh, last I saw, our our tonnage export is in the 30 million ton range, which is uh, uh, not an all-time record. We we used to export a lot more back in the 90s, but Price-wise, it's an all-time Absolutely, uh, and I think the value of the coal export from West Virginia exceeds uh, on a t on a per ton basis. Uh, you know, the value of coal uh, that is exported from other states, and again, yes. it's tied directly to the to the quality of this coal and 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 to the uh, you know the uh, export met market. Right. Uh, 500 million tons, half or 500 million dollars, uh, uh, half a billion dollars uh, from from one industry. That is truly remarkable, and mm. and uh, you know I I think mm. worthy of uh, of uh, you know some some additional attention. And mm. a great deal of that, or a portion of that, goes back to uh, the local share uh, right. of of uh, severance that's returned to the counties, and that's used for a variety of uh, infrastructure and. Mm -hmm. And s government services within those the, counties. Uh, it used to be about a decade ago, about $16 million a year would go back to local governments, including municipalities as well as counties. It's now very close to $40 million. Oh, okay. So a big jump there. And then actually, it's going to increase uh, starting next fiscal year. Uh, there's a phase in over five years. Uh, so an extra 5% will go back to producing counties beyond uh, current distribution levels. So it's a significant amount of. Revenue going back to the counties, and the counties also.